it is on. Um, I always need to put this this uh, GIF because that's the way you say that um, in in <laughs> slides. Um, and I didn't really have like a good way to really sandwich it in the deck, so I just put it at the start. Um, and then I was like, well, I have to like make a really really bad joke as well. Um, so I think that um, the question is, is it Laurel or Yanni? Is the is now the title of my talk? Um, I actually for just about like 10 minutes ago decided that the title should be Design All the Things, but the actual uh, title is No Such Thing as Adult Problem. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Michael. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the genesis of this talk lives in uh, some thoughts that I've had for years, and I really hope, this is like a pilot, so I really hope that this like kind of comes out properly in this format. Um, so I'm a product designer at Facebook. Um, funnily enough, specifically with this song, um, I had just started working on this team called Privacy and Data Use, um, which um, means that my day-to-day -day is probably quite different than what you would expect from a normal design role. Um, I spend a lot of time right now auditing our products, um, asking questions, uh, trying to like, simplify and clarify things, um, communicating suggestions and guidelines, although we haven't really spent that much time um, yet on this. But we are definitely sta staffing up a really big effort around this. Um, and so that, you know, that doesn't really sound like a lot of design work right now. I'm doing just a lot of documentation and a lot of um, capturing, um, which is where I kind of want to spend some time broadening the definition of what is design work. So if you would um, ask me how much actual execution I have done over the last three and a half years working on all of these teams, um, it would um, probably be less than a quarter of the time. Um, for these efforts, um, and for many efforts, um, above a certain scale, a lot of what you do as a designer is all about communication, um, creating consensus, uh, and just being an effective design partner by figuring out what are the hypotheses that you are trying to prove or disprove, and then what is the process to which you will get to an outcome here. Um, so to take a little step back, uh, this was me about a decade ago. Um, I was about two years into running a design studio. I had just um, graduated, and um, the, th the thing that I really cared deeply about was design and specifically how to execute design. It was like everything needs to be cool, everything needs to be elegant, you know. Um, and so, because I once fancied myself to become an engineer, um, which I clearly was not good at, um, I learned how to write code to at least make the things that I was designing um, come alive. And so, um, this led me to build a lot of things. Um, I spent some time last year actually trying to revive a lot of those old projects that were just built in old PHP and they're really bad. Um, but this is somewhere on the internet. I don't even think that Google can find it yet because there's no link to it. Um, but these were um, just like interesting projects that were interesting to me. They were interesting because I could, I did not have any constraints. I could use any technology that I wanted. I could use bleeding edge CSS3, which kind of like dates me in a way. Um, you know, it didn't really matter that your average browser could run this. Um, they were truly just kind of, in a, the worst way to say it, kind of masturbatory exercises um, to like get on the internet and just like get all the likes. Um, but while I spent the time doing this, I noticed that this was kind of what was being proliferated in our industry. Like at the time, the should designers code question was alive and well. Um, and, um, and really making these like cool interactive things in browsers, because mobile wasn't really that big then, was um, a really important thing. So I was like, cool. Um, so this was me like, yeah, 2012. But then I realized <laughs> it was not really True. Um, so I'd focused all my time on this execution and you know, trying to like, figure out who I was while I was doing these things. And this was like part of my identity. And I was like on the internet. And I had like a bunch of followers. Um, but what I didn't see was the bigger picture. And the worst case about this was I didn't even know that there was a bigger picture. Um, I didn't, I had these little side projects, they were just like, Oh, like how cool can I make something bounce? So like how can I make something fade? Oh, what's the performance in this browser? What's that? Um, and at our design studio, um, which we ran, we ran for about like five and a half years, um, we cared about client satisfaction. And the funny thing about that is that, you know, around 2006 to 11 is, this, is the time frame, no one really knew how to like value impact. I was back in the Netherlands. No one even knew what impact was. And so therefore, as long as the client's happy, we're happy. 
as long as you know, we are making money, we are happy. Um, but because we didn't have any objective way or at least like multiple subjective ways, a formula by which we could make design decisions and by which we could implement our products, that was like kind of frustrating to me. Um, and in a way, the fact that we didn't have that made a lot of sense because um, our industry is very young. Design, sure, design has been around for a while. Um, we've had um, information architects around for a while. We've had user experience architects around for a while. Um, but digital design, in a way, is really new. We haven't really looked at what it means to be a digital product designer. Maybe for the last decade, we've actually used the term product designer. I still remember when, I think the first one was Facebook, when I said, oh, product designer. They're not really making any like, physical products. Why would they call them a product designer? Um, and because the notion of digital product design is so new and it's been evolving so rapidly, whatever we use to kind of calibrate ourselves comes from the tangible world. And um, in a way, we kind of fetishize these things. So good design makes a product useful, sure. Good design makes a product understandable, sure. Good design is long lasting, maybe. So this good design is long lasting, which is one of Dieter Rams's um, uh, 10 principles of design, might not even work in our medium. Like we don't create final products. We generally add or evolve a thing that is a living, or like not really an organism, but is a living system. And that will be ever evolving, not just based on what we do with it, but also what people add to it. Um, and so the moment that I really started questioning again what it meant to make these design decisions in, in the larger scale products that we start making was um, shortly after I moved to San Francisco. So uh, through some confluence of some you know, really fortunate events, I, I will say that I got very lucky with this one, um, I got an email from um, Instagram. And so my whole uh, designer engineer combo, make cool shit in the internet stuff that got noticed. Um, and, um, and Instagram really needed someone to own and build out their web product. And so moved out here, learned Python, did all the things. Um, and we had a long way to go feature-wise back then, but we didn't really have to make many discerning product decisions at the time. It was very clear what we needed to build over and over again. We didn't have photo tagging, we added that photo tagging, we didn't have video, we added video iOS 7 came out, we weren't gonna look like iOS 6. This all makes kind of a lot of sense. Um, but as we are adding design and product work, we are adding this like large amount of questions that, that comes up. This abundance of questions without like any central way of validating. So there's a theme here. There is this notion of, oh, I'm working for clients and they don't know how to validate if this is success. So I don't know how to validate if this is success. Instagram launches things and everyone loves us, but we weren't even logging a lot, so we didn't even know what we were doing. Um, and as soon as we started really like implementing logging and like started looking at the data, we realized we were doing very well and this was all like fun and games and all super cool. Except that in my mind, just being opinionated, which is how we rolled back then, wasn't like really satisfying to me. I actually wanted something more. And so I was, pretty like, excited about being able to execute and being able to build all these products, but not making these decisions in a very holistic, consistent way was really starting to irk me. Um, and so after three years of working on, um, on Instagram, um, and I never thought that this would actually happen, um, I kind of went from a world of constant iterative launches with like golden hours and everyone loves you and beautiful unicorns and rainbows to what I now like to call building a highway system. So I joined the search team at Facebook, um, and there's uh, very little fanfare to this job. Um, you actually don't really want any fanfare in your job. The times that you get noticed is the time, times that you do it absolutely wrong. And we have done many things absolutely wrong here. Um, the highway analogy works very well if you like drive on the 101 sometimes. You kind of experience like what we were doing with the product at the time, with the potholes that we have here. So at the time, I had no idea how to do good design work in a realm of, of a very infrastructure-based product. Uh, many things that I learned from being effective at executing were completely irrelevant. Um, try and 
engineer a search engine. I don't even know where to start. I still don't know where to start. I've been, I did this thing for like three, three years. Um, and there's no single value proposition. If you have a product like Instagram, you can probably figure out rather quickly that people come here to either consume or produce media. But when you think about a search engine, you can come in for any different reason. I'm trying to find my friend. I'm trying to find a business. I'm trying to find a place nearby that I don't even know that I'm looking for. I'm trying to find a piece of content. I'm trying to figure out if it's Yenny or Laurel. Um, and so when you think about the basics of, of these search products, then you're like, well, there's actually not that much going on. Like there's a bunch of surfaces. Um, and so that means when you're designing search, you're actually building an engine. And when you're building an engine, again, you're building this like ever evolving system. You don't even know what's, what inventory is in the system. You don't even know who's using it, what device they're using to use it on. Um, you don't know how big their friend graphs are. You don't know anything really about the user that's using your product at the time. Even with the vast amounts of data that you can have, you generally don't have a sense as a designer. You can't even remotely come close to intuitively feel like you did the right job. Even, you can build an ideal use case and zero people on the planet will actually see this thing happen. And so going back to my execution mindset, you know, building a search engine, I'm gonna build a weather widget actually did that, um, but we, we never implemented it because no one was searching for weather on Facebook. Um, so you're like, cool, like weather widgets, you know, movie widgets, you can build all that stuff. Um, but what should you actually design? And this gets me to a very vivid memory of um, my manager coming to me, oh, I love slide transitions, my manager coming to me and saying, hey, can you please redesign the type ahead? And I'm like, type ahead. Thing has like rows, there's like a box. Can't really do a lot with that. That's not like what what does that, what design needs to happen here? Sure, do the ro rows need to be smaller? Does the text need to be bold? Does the icon need to be better? Um, and there's not a lot of surface area here, but you can try to do a bunch of design work. You can like really try to do a lot of like design work. And so once you actually really dig in, <laughs> this is just like very dark times, um, <laughs> you, you notice that from an interaction and a, and a design perspective, it actually gets really exciting. Like, you know, what, what happens if someone presses a character? How do you, like, they shouldn't be able to click on any of the rows. There's a lot of like very interaction nuance that you need to talk about. But as soon as you've got that done, like generally this interaction pattern like kind of works pretty well. Um, but there, you don't know what intents you're serving and you don't know exactly what you were looking for to show people at, at any given moment in time. So instead of designing the surface, it's more important to start understanding how the system works. And so to, ask, to, to figure out how the system works is like, well, how do suggestions get generated? How does this surface respond um, when I enter a character? Like which experiments have we run? Because like Facebook runs many experiments at the same time. Like um, how many keywords are we showing? How many people are we showing? Um, what kind of ranking systems do we use? And what are the results of those experiments that we have run? Because a lot of these things get run and maybe just get thrown away. Like this stuff never gets looked at or it just gets invalidated by, based on a wrong assumption. And so once you've looked at the system, which is, I've actually been trying to figure out if there's a specific way of empathy towards the system and if we need a word for this. And maybe I'm just ignorant and don't know the word yet. You also need to have this empathy for like people's behaviors. And so now you know like the way the system acts at current, you can ask what are people doing? How many characters do they enter? I think the mean at the time was like five or six and then they would just tap on a suggestion. Um, what kind of suggestions do they tap on? What is the location, like what is the index of, of this suggestion? Is it number one, number two, number three? Um, and why do we believe they tap on this suggestion? So all those mocks earlier, really what we wanted to do was just like to get to that stage. And we eventually got there. And we knew that we wanted to get there, but it took about two years to build that. Um, because we didn't, we weren't able to answer this question very well. Like how do you know that you're doing the right thing? If you just run a flat experiment and you're going to say, okay, we have a billion searches here and we change this thing and performance goes up and now we have a billion and one searches, how do you know if that's good? What if click-through rate goes down? What if these searches, what if there are more searches because the quality, wow, because the quality of the, <laughs> of the search engine is less, is less good than it used to be. <laughs> I 
think the robots are mad at me. It's going to have to cool down and warm up again, doesn't it? All right, I'll just keep on talking. Um, so one of the things that you then start wondering is like, if, you have to, if you have to validate your decisions and you, you know what the system is doing and you kind of know what people want, um, you still don't have the answer of like, what are people looking for? What results should we show them? Um, how, um, how do we actually know that we are showing these results? Um, we, can, we can have a billion of these experiments going down the pipe every day, and we don't even know if, like, if we're best friends, if my name is showing up, if you just type the first M character. Like, we didn't have those systems in place. Um, and so end to end, the thing that we need to do is we need to design these steps. And so as a designer, I hope that this eventually will go on, because this is an important slide. Um, as a designer, we can start figuring out, um, if, we ask our, if we ask the question, what are people looking for, then we, we, we are very comfortable sitting down with, with research on design. But we are not comfortable in sitting down with data scientists and sitting down with our data engineers. And so we can ask them very pointed questions as to what are people looking for. Can you please get me um, what they call bigrams and trigrams, which are like the common two or three words that are being used together. Can you please do any kind of coding or like do some, throw some ML, ML models that are hopefully not biased um, at, um, at our query logs and figure out like what are, like are they looking for movies? Are they looking for music? Like what kind of behavior gets done here? And then when we think about what results we show them, as design, we need to sit down with a ranking team and actually say, well, actually, well, we noticed in research and from data that um, people are looking for Deadpool. That's cool. Uh, Deadpool's not in our ranking model. Why is it not showing up that high? Um, and how do we know that we are actually showing these? This was a very big one for, for the team. Um, we put systems in place that would, on the back end, test a golden set of queries to figure out when they would fail. And sometimes they would fail. Like some ranking model that was a quick test would mess something up, and all of a sudden, you know, Deadpool or your best friend or a friend from like 10 years ago just wouldn't show up in the system anymore. And then how do we measure success? Sure, we can like pump up volume. We can say, hey, 1 billion, 1.5 billion. But if no one clicks on a result because search is actually failing, yes, then they're doing duplicate searches. And there's a host of, of um, metrics that you can use for that. Um, so this is where the title kind of comes in. On the surface, this is not really a shiny problem. Like when you asked, or when I was asked to actually check out if I wanted to join a search team, I was like, what am I going to design here? Like how is this actually going to work out? Um, but I found eventually that it was just immensely impactful. Um, while we give a lot of like energy and a lot of time to what it means to execute, what it means to like be a good prototype or how to make a thing bounce. Um, I actually found that we are more in charge of bridging the gap between people and technology. And a bouncy effect doesn't really have to do a lot with that, although I do like them. Um, we're not here to define a problem. We're not here to just define a problem and design a solution. Um, for the longest time, I think we as designers were told that this is our job. And therefore, like, we need to come to you with some pixels, and you will go, you're going to have to implement this for me. And then, we, and then the engineers weren't good enough. And then they were like, oh, well, you as designer should code so you can actually do it properly, because apparently we're not good enough. Um, and, um, but what I actually believe is that you know, we, we are responsible for designing everything. We're responsible for designing the processes by which we get to these solutions. We are, desi we are designing uh, the systems that, like, eventually, or like we, we as designers need to understand and then redesign the systems that we are using to create all these products with. We get to design our context. That doesn't just mean that we get to design things, but that does mean that in case you have a week, a month, or a quarter of work that might not seem that interesting to you, you get to decide how you design, how you spend your time. It's one of those things where if you're not organizationally a priority, well, that's fine, but design your time in a different way. Use your time to teach other people on your team what, the way you think. Like align 
what this is what I like to call align your work with personal growth. So when my goal was with switching to the search team was I wanted to learn how to make a quote unquote objective decision um, on some design like decisions that I was making. And along the way, I, I had to learn how to do product management because I was writing documents and running meetings. I had to learn data analysis because I didn't trust my data scientists, which is a very, very weird feeling. Um, and I had to learn how to ask really hard product questions and run product reviews with all these pieces, with this is the roadmap that we're setting out. The, these are the data points that we're looking for. And that is not classically what I thought I was going to be doing as a designer. Um, and what I thought was really cool when I got more comfortable with this broad array of like, you know, I'm not a data scientist, but like I know how to look at it. So this host of skills, like can I do a little bit of coding? Yes. Can I do a little bit of data science? Yes. Can I do a little bit of um, product management? Sure. All of these things are things that you can relay to other people. And then all of a sudden, instead of having three PMs, three designers, and 30 engineers, you have three designers that are pseudo PMs that kind of know data science and a bunch of PMs that you now know that might not be as good as their job as you thought they were, um, and 30 engineers. Um, and so the ability to augment other people's abilities and to grow your team in that way is a very, very important thing because that way we cultivate how we solve problems. And, and if we can all do that, together because I think we as designers are responsible for this. And, and if you're a product manager or if you're an engineer, sorry, um, but you, we are all responsible to making, for making these products together. Like we should all have empathy. It's not a designer's job to have empathy, but it is our job to maybe convey empathy to the roles that don't necessarily feel like they should be doing this. Um, and so the thing that I would like to leave you with is that in any given product space with any problem that you're working on. If you're having a day that you're doing your job and you're like, ah, I'm not really interested in like actually do, in solving this problem, help someone else sol solve a problem. Like help someone in a different discipline solve a problem. And just do your job, go at it, but then make sure that the, the environment that you are currently living in, you design it in a way that you want to live in it. And then you amplify everyone around you to make this a better place. Thanks.